thank you for taking the time out to talk about wraparound services. Um, I would like to start off with you maybe sharing your credentials, if you would like. Okay, uh, social worker, BSW. Okay. Um, been doing it since the 90s. <laughs> the 90s. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's the best way I can put it right now. You know, uh, I've been everywhere in the field, all around. Okay. Everywhere in the field. What, what, why are you in children's mental health? Um, well, I mean, that's just kind of where it uh, it's led me at the moment. Okay. You know, again, like I said, I've been all over the field and I've been in mental health, left mental health, came back to mental health, left it again. Now I'm back again. Now you're back again. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So we're talking about wraparound services. Can you explain what wraparound services is? Yeah, well, you know, wraparound, um, it's a little different than the traditional type of services like case management. Mm -hmm. Wraparound kind of focuses on the strengths of the family okay. as well as the needs of the family. And so it's not just, um, it's not like a, a service based or a service driven type of um, type of program, I guess you could say. It's not really even a program, it's a process wraparound. Okay. So um, yeah, the wraparound process focuses on the strengths and the needs of the family. Okay, is that, well, let me ask this first. What is the eligibility or is there a certain criteria you, the child has to have to be placed in wraparound? Well, it kind of depends. See the thing, like when you, when you mention criteria and that sort of thing, in the mental health world, there may be a particular criteria and then in the juvenile justice world, let's say there may be a different kind of criteria. Wraparound isn't a clinical for mental health. It, it, it's in the mental health system, but it's in every other system as well. It's a okay. process that could be used in, in foster care. It's a process that can be used in, again, juvenile justice. Whatever, you know, wherever there are children, it's a process that could be used. Okay. Now, um, in the mental health, field, however, you want to look at the um, at different ratings like the CAFIS, the Child and, and, and Family, uh, um, uh, what is it, Functioning Scale, Functioning Assessment, whatever, I can't say it right now, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but uh, the CAFIS and, um, you know, the score may determine whether or not that family needs more intensive services. So wraparound is usually done when there's a need for intensive type of service. Okay, and when you say intensive, what does that look like? like where is the child? Um, okay, well, since you mentioned mental health, we'll stick with that for the moment. Okay. So say in mental health, I mean, you know, when traditional type of services are not working, when, when the child needs something a little bit more intensive, let's say like more intensive therapy and that sort of thing. You know, wraparound is also one of those services that falls, if you want to call it a service again, it's one of those processes that falls up under, you know, intensive services. Okay, so what what would one of your meetings with the family look like? Well, the first thing you have to understand about wraparound is that you, in wraparound, you develop what's called a child and family team. Okay. And that team is identified supports from the child's natural world, meaning like the family or whatnot, uh, and from the professional world as well. You know, social workers, school social workers, teachers, all kinds of whoever's involved in that child's life. So you develop a team, the child and family team, and on that team, you want to uh, you want to identify the strengths of each team member, you know, okay. and where they fit in, so to speak, you know. And you think about wraparound, you hear the term, and it's it's just what it sounds like, you know. All of these different support systems are wrapping around that child. Okay. You know, so um, a typical meeting, <laughs> it's. Um, Let's look at a typical child and family team meeting. 
Okay. If it happens, you want to do that, you know, at least once a month. Um, maybe even, you know, at, at the at the very least every quarter. But I would say once a month, you want to at least do that where all of your team members get together. So a child and family team could look like uh, let's say mother, father, whoever else is in the home that's positive for that child. Um, they could have a teacher involved. They could have the probation officer involved, whoever again is involved. And we kind of, you know, we go over the, um, we review the strengths, you know, and the child will have goals, you know, and those goals are also reviewed at that time. But uh, the need is reviewed. And, um, you know, it's, it's no typical meeting. You know, that's okay. the one thing about wraparound. Okay. Wraparound is not typical at all. It's okay. very uh, centered to each different child's uniquenesses, you know. So whatever and, and that family right. dynamic is, you know, it's going to center around that. Okay. Yeah. Um, are most of the children at risk of being removed from the home? Uh, no, I wouldn't say that. Okay. No, no okay. but there, I mean, it depends on, again, like I said, again, wraparound is the furthest thing from anything that's dealing with almost like a cookie cutter type of expectation. Because again, it's for each, it's individualized for each family's needs. You know, so that child Let's say we have one child, he may be on the verge of being removed from the home because he may be in those systems, you know, okay. he may be in foster care, he may be in juvenile justice where there's a probation officer involved, things of that nature. And then you may have a kid that, um, you know, doesn't have any of those particular entities in his life. He's just having all kind of troubles in school. He's getting suspended all the time, destroying property in the school, getting into fights in school. So you see, that's not, that kid is not necessarily uh, on the verge of being removed, but then now you have to deal with those particular needs. So let's say with that particular kid, his needs sound like there are a lot of them are based around him, you know, socially and being in school. So those are the kind of um, entities from the uh, professional world that you're probably going to deal with in a case like that. So it varies greatly <laughs> from case to case. Each so, case is going to have its own uniqueness. So in mental health, um, all of the children are eligible for it, or is it a certain um, designation like children with DD, are they um, eligible for the service too? Well, I would say that, um, you see, this is the thing. When you deal with, with Medicaid, and a lot of, uh, you know, children's mental health agencies deal with Medicaid, then you have to be careful because certain things can't cross, mm -hmm. you know, like for instance, um, wraparound supports coordination, wraparound uh, case management, you know, those services, I, they can't really cross dealing with Medicaid. You know, Why because the, the the billing of them, it, it'll be almost like uh, I don't know if it's I don't know if you can call it double billing. I don't want to say for certain because I can't think of the exact um, term to say, but um, okay. it, it 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 has something to do with the billing. Okay, know. so tell me yeah. what is the difference between wraparound supports coordination and case management? Well, wraparound is really different. Um, you take something like supports coordination and, and case management, those, I think wraparound is a little bit more empowering for the family because it kind of puts the family more so in the driver's seat, you know, as far as it's not as service oriented, you know, those other things are more service oriented. And with wraparound, everybody, it, it, it's, it's all about that child and family team. You know, it's all about the, the supports and you're focusing on the strengths. That's your major focus, you know, is on the strengths of that client, the strengths of that family, the strengths of the support systems, you know, and that's the big focus. 
Whereas um, case management, you know, you might even be picking somebody up, taking them somewhere to take care of some business or, you know, it, it's not that, um, it, it you don't do that kind of stuff. It's more hands-on with the family. It's more hands-on with the client. Is it a challenge trying to find their strength with so much going on in be. the home? Yeah, I mean, it could be. You know, it, again, there is, it's, it's so different for each family. There could okay. very well be that, and there could be not much going on in the home, but something's going on in that child's life. So, you know, it's, it, it varies, you know, I'll tell you a difficulty in, um, in dealing with a, a child and family team is actually putting the team together, you know, now and that's why the difficulty. That? Well, you get some families where, you know, parent may not want so-and-so in their business, you know, they may not want the, uh, the teacher involved, or the pro well, the probation officer, they may have to have them involved, but, you know, in some instances, you know, some of the professional supports, they may not want them involved in their personal life. So, you know, you, cause wraparound gets kind of intimate, you know, it definitely gets intimate with, um, the wraparound facilitator. It gets intimate with the different people on the child and family team. And when I say it gets intimate, I mean, in the sense that, you know, these people are coming into the family's home, you know, whether it's on a Zoom call or in person, they're coming into that family's life, you know, in major ways. So sometimes it could be hard identifying people for that team. Okay. Now, as far as bringing out the strengths, you know, it's just strengths assessments and that sort of thing. You, you'll definitely be able to bring out the strengths in, in someone, okay. you know, unless they're, you know, they don't want to be involved. Sometimes you get people who don't really know what it is and they don't want to get involved because they're looking for something more so like a case management, you know? And then, okay, so let me ask then, is wraparound mandatory? No, no. It's not mandatory. No, well, I mean, you know, well, well, now, again, you know, we're talking about all kind of different systems. A judge might say it's mandatory. Okay. You know what I mean? Okay. So, you know, it depends on the circumstance. It's extremely, again, extremely circumstantial to, to that client's uh, needs. How long do you support a family? Wraparound is a program you really want to look at about a year and a half, year, year and a half, two years at the most. And the reason for that is because you're trying to empower the family. You're not there to do the work for the family. Okay. You know what I mean? You're there mm -hmm. to build up the strengths in the support systems that are still going to be in that child's life when the wraparound facilitator walks away. You know what I mean? So you want to definitely make sure everything, it's like you're strengthening the supports for that child, you know? Do you, is it possible then after two years, um, when you're off of the, out of the family's lives, can you then come back in? Well, I mean, they could always, um, you know, reapply for a wraparound, you know? Okay, okay. Okay. That's so, always something that can happen, but there's, you know, there's got to be the criteria. The need has got to be there. You mentioned in mental health, for instance, that CAFA score has got to be there. There's got to be the, the actual need there. And then you know? when is the, the CAFA assessment given? Is it given an intake um, during some part within therapy the clinician sees so, a need. Well, when you, yeah, when you deal with mental health, you know, if they're if they're at an agency, that CAFIS is going to be there the whole time they're there, you know, it, and it's reassessed every, I believe, every three months, every 90 days. I believe. Okay. Every 90 days, every, mm -hmm. it's reassessed. So, um, yeah, I mean, that, um, and that, that criteria, if that CAFIS goes down low and there doesn't show an actual need for the in more intensive services, then, you know, they probably won't be getting back into wraparound, you know, because there are criteria. There's criteria, you know, across the board dealing with wraparound as far as, um, 
you know, getting in wrap around. There's criteria as far as the type of assessments you have to do, you know, and that's, you know, it's pretty much across the board in, um, in the state, they have what's called a wraparound f fidelity model. So there is an actual fidelity model that you have to follow for it. Okay. Um, what's your biggest challenge supporting family? Biggest challenge? Um, well, just kind of getting people to open up to the actual process of wraparound. That could be a challenge because again, like I mentioned earlier, you get people who say, well, I don't want so-and-so in my business, but so-and-so may be an actual good support for that child in the ways that they do support that child. You know, it could be, let's just say, uh, there's an uncle who drives the kid to school every day and picks him up from school every day. You know what I mean? That person is a support in that child's life where there's right. a need. Right. right, So, you, you know, and then you may get the mom who, doesn't like that uncle because it's the dad's brother. So the mom doesn't want him on the team because she doesn't want him to know what's going on in the house because it'll get back to the dad. Okay. And, you know, so it's just regular people issues, I okay. guess you can say, are the um, actual difficulty. But, but there's always ways around things, you know, where you can make things happen. Okay. It just takes time sometimes. What would you change about children's mental health? What would I change about children's mental health? <laughs> Since I work in children's mental health, I, yes. um, what I would say is, um, if I would say a, a couple of things to change in children's mental health, mm -hmm. I would say that um, maybe the Medicaid system itself needs some kind of overhauling. I'll just put it like that. I agree. You know, yeah, the children's mental health system relies heavily on Medicaid. And Medicaid is not a perfect system by any stretch of imagination. Right. You know, right. and um, I think that um, in children's mental health, I think that one thing that could change is there could be more... Um, people could be trained more on cultural understanding, you know, and, um, and the population that you work with. If you work like in Detroit, for instance, nine times out of 10, the population is going to be little black boys between the ages of, let's say, seven and 15, let's say, you know? And if you don't really know that particular population, how are you going to help them? <laughs> you know, right. what are you going to do? Right. You, know, you have to you understand. Them? Right. You yeah, have to understand exactly. the family dynamics and the culture. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. I totally get it. Totally. Get it. What advice would you offer to parents navigating the system? Um, what the mental health system? Uh, mm -hmm. Is it parents? another system? What What other systems you want to oh, yeah. share okay. advice yeah. on? Yeah, the foster care system, my God, that's the one that people really need help navigating through the most, in my okay. opinion. Okay, okay. But, um, and then you got the juvenile justice system parents need, because, you know, take juvenile justice system and, and the foster care system, both, I guess you could say, you deal with a lot of legal situations in those mm -hmm. systems. Mm -hmm. So that in itself could be difficult for a parent to maneuver through. Now, right. the mental health uh, field, I guess it, what could be difficult is stigma, stigmatization of uh, certain diagnoses and that sort of thing. And a parent may kind of feel, you know, embarrassed, I guess, sometimes, um, you know, things of that nature. They could, um, they could be kind of... Uh, that was the word. I'm trying to pick the right words, not necessarily clinical words, but <laughs> the right words. I guess that parent can just, you know, it's, it's not an easy system to navigate, you know, because there's a lot of new information that you're not knowing about. And just understanding that your child's behavior may not be coming like from them, they're they might not have control of it. 
You know what I mean? As a parent, that's not easy to understand when he's tearing up the house and smashing the TVs. And, you know, a lot of parents are ready to go for a belt. You know, that's the mind frame. But then that child may not be in control of all of their um, mental faculties. So it's not an easy one to come to grips with. Right. So understanding the causes of the behavior. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. You mentioned you mentioned difficulties in the wraparound process. Mm-hmm. I guess one difficulty in mental health that you come across is it's where the referral is coming from. That could be an issue because if the referral is coming from someone who does not quite understand what wraparound is, say you get a therapist who um, feels that this client may need some mentoring services, you know, and then they send them to wraparound. That's not necessarily the purpose of wraparound, although you wear every hat imaginable when you're a wraparound facilitator. So at some point in time, that may come into play, but that's not necessarily a particular reason to refer someone to wraparound services. So I guess the difficulty that I'm I'm thinking of comes from when, you know, you get a therapist or whoever, again, is making the referral and they don't quite know what wraparound services are. And a lot of times, you, you get referrals that should have gone to, let's say, case management, and it's coming to wrap around. So that is a difficulty. That's a pain in the butt, but uh, that's a difficulty. What is your caseload max in wrap around? With wrap around, and this is a part of the fidelity model as well. So this is across the board. With wrap around, you have 10 cases, okay? That's now, your limit? Yeah, well, the limit is 12. However, you have 10 cases, but if you have a couple of cases in transition, you can do two cases. What I mean by transition is if they're transitioning off of wraparound. Okay. You know, they have two, but no more than 12. And that's if you have cases in transition. If you don't have cases in transition, then the caseload is 10. Really? Okay. How much time do you... Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, it seems like that's not, you know, a very large caseload, but you're doing a lot of stuff. You know, you're involved with a lot of different entities. You're not just meeting with that client. You're meeting with school people. You're meeting with probation officers, whoever, whoever, and whoever are in that child's life. Okay. So you're at schools, at the school sometimes in IEP meetings, you're um, yeah. you're in court with juvenile court sometimes yes it depends okay. on again whatever system you know you're dealing with them so yes to all of that how long is a is a meeting with a parent like you're scheduling a meeting how long can a meeting be it can be as long as it needs to be wow. okay <laughs> you know what I mean you might be in I've been in I have been in meetings before um I mean, over three hours, you know, so it, it, it varies. It just depends on that need. It depends on that particular um, situation, that client situation okay. and the circumstance. Wow. Okay, well, I want to thank you so much for your time, sharing your expertise. Well, thank you, you for having me.